Good uh, morning, everybody, uh, chiefs, um, everybody that's here uh, from the media. And um, we're here today to speak on the Lake Manitoba, Lake St. Martin Channels Outlet Project. We're here in solidarity with um, uh, some distinguished guests, um, uh, and we're standing in support uh, with um, the MMF, the Assembly of First Nations, and also the Interlake Reserves Tribal Council. So um, we're here to uh, call on the provincial government to deal fairly with um, um, all those parties involved and um, hopefully bring them to the table to um, discuss nation to nation um, the benefits of this project and how we can all benefit from it. I'm going to ask um, Chief Cornell McLean from um, Lake Manitoba to come up and uh, say our opening remarks. Hi, good morning. Uh, I'm Chief Cornell McLean of the Lake Manitoba First Nation. I'm also the chairman of the Interlake Reserves Tribal Council, which represents six First Nations. Um, Pegasus First Nation being one of the largest in Manitoba, or the largest in Manitoba, as well as uh, Penamutang, um, Dauphin River, Little Saskatchewan, <clears throat> Kinojeshtagan, and uh, you know uh, Lake Manitoba, of course. Uh, just with that, we just wanted to bring uh, notice to uh, you know to the to the province on how how we've been treated as First Nations people by the government of Manitoba. Um, no consultation on their part um, regards to uh, the work that has started in the in the in the Interlake uh, area, um, working without permits. Um, the impact assessments where they've already uh, you know determine the impacts and uh, we haven't even determined them ourselves as uh, as traditional land uh, owners you know there, there's lots of things that we have to think about the fishing industry for each first nation we have several communities in our area that depend on on the fisheries for their way of life also our, our hunting and traditional lands uh, where the medicines are being uh, disturbed and the animals are are moving off those areas and we're not able to uh, provide for our families and also the the new legislations with the with all the hunting stuff and that and we just want to be uh, treated fairly respected as First Nations people and have a chance to uh, you know uh, show the government that uh, we can work collaboratively with anybody and uh, I'd, I'd like to also thank uh, uh, President Chartrand and uh, the MMF and also the AFN Regional Chief, Kevin Hart, for intervening in um, this process. Miigwech. Thank you, Cornell. Um, so uh, what we'd like to do is to have uh, uh, some uh, guest presentations, uh, three to five minutes, and uh, I'm going to call on uh, uh, Chief John Stagg, Dauphin River First Nation. Hello, everyone. I'd just like to uh, welcome everybody on this difficult time. Like dealing with uh, COVID, then uh, when we dealt with that 2011 flood, you know, it was very, uh, very devastating for our community. You know, Dauphin River is uh, right at the lake of, uh, the mouth of Lake Winnipeg. With this new channel they're opposing, it's only uh, three kilometers south as the crow flies from my community. But it's going to impact us quite a bit. I don't know if, if this channel is good to go through. For us, it could be right now, but we got to look at the future, you know, for our, for the future of our, our people. But um, I just like to thank the MMF and the, all the chiefs that are here, standing solidarity. And, uh, that's all I want to say, miigwech. Thank you, Chief. Uh, we'd like to call on Chief. Regional Chief Kevin Hart from the Assembly of First Nations, and he's going to say a few words. I want to acknowledge the uh, Treaty 1 territory this morning, as well as to acknowledge the Interlake Reserve Tribal Council, and of course our relatives from the MMF that are here with us this morning. Uh, today, of course, you see what's transpiring out on the East Coast, relatives, and I just want to state that and reiterate that what's transpiring right here in Manitoba is exactly 
what the Interlake Reserve Tribal Councils are fighting for is meaningful consultation and dialogue. What has transpired right now with the uh, construction as well as the ongoing work of the uh, channel, it's an, indeed an infringement on treaty and inherent rights of the Interlake Reserve Tribal Council members as well as First Nation members in Manitoba uh, as a whole because there was not uh, meaningful consultation under Section 35 that is protected under the Constitution and that, uh, you know, the province of Manitoba being part of Canada in Confederation is in uh, um, clear violation of various treaties here in Manitoba to the effect that is constantly constitutionally protected under Section 35. Even more so, First Nations were not allowed meaningful resources to conduct proper environmental impact assessments, as well as the resources to go with providing a proper environmental impact statement. I understand through various channels in that, including the Clean Environment Commission, and that uh, you know the Minister of the Environment, DFO and such, at the, the Canadian and the federal level, we have to reach out to those various ministers, including uh, to let Prime Minister Trudeau know and the Attorney General of Canada know that Manitoba is in violation of Section 35 in consultation, and that for myself as Regional Chief for Manitoba, I had no choice but to intervene in this matter to protect the rights, both treaty and inherit of all First Nations citizens here in Manitoba. Even more so that the violation of these treaties as well as the violation uh, under Section 35 and our treaties here in Manitoba, the various numbered treaties, uh, it goes to show uh, the systemic racism in legislation, law and policy that has clearly been a part of apartheid and oppression not only by provinces, but the Canadian government itself. And uh, you could see with our relatives, as well as the action, standing in solidarity yesterday with our relatives out east, that First Nations here in Manitoba will no longer stand for violations of our treaties, let alone the proper consultation by governments, both provincially and federally, when it comes to the lands, waters, and the territories that we share. Thank you. So moving moving along, um, I'm going, going to introduce uh, Minister Will Gooden from the Manitoba Métis Federation, who's here with us today to say a few words. Thank you very much, Jim, and uh, I want to say thank you to Carl for the prayer. Um, always, we uh, when we start off, that we acknowledge our elders and our veterans who have uh, done all the hard work to bring us to where we are here today. I want to say thank you to the Interlake Reserves Tribal Council for. Uh, the opportunity to be here today in solidarity. Um, the, the issue that we're facing today is such an important one. If, if consultation rights are eroded or gone um, because of the actions of a premier and a minister, then, um, then you know, the, the next steps that come after us uh, is going to be uh, even worse as we, as we try to assert our place uh, in uh, what is now Canada. Uh, so on behalf of President David Chartrand and Minister Jack Park, I want to say that it's an honour to be here. Um, I think it says something when uh, about a so-called consultation process when leaders um, gather like they are here today that there's, there's obviously very, very grave concerns. Um, so uh, I also wanted to uh, just touch base on uh, a couple other things and, and I know that we had the uh, event yesterday uh, supporting the Mi'kmaq uh, leaders, the Mi'kmaq fishers, um, and thank uh, Chief Hart for uh, his words there yesterday and again today. Um, that's, you know, th those issues um, are all tied together. Um, the things that we're fighting for today are all tied together. Um, I want to um, go over a little bit of the uh, history as uh, was sort of the, uh, interface that we had with the province on this issue because I think um, if we can understand what happened, um, what was said in the past, 
then we can have a good understanding of where, why we're here today and why we're at such a terrible impasse. So in 2013, the province began the conceptual design leading to the project, and at that time, the province told the MMF that there were no funds to undertake community consultation. Um, again, even though consultation has been a part of the legal structure of Canada for um, much longer than that, um, I'm not sure um, what the rationale was given that they wouldn't consult. Um, but in July 2016, the province wrote to the MMF um, and they said that they had a duty to consult with the Manitoba Métis community on the project. Uh, in December 2017, the province agreed to fund a technical review. Now, I want to underline that because uh, this is uh, it's going to be important as we uh, go through the timeline here. They were going to fund a technical review of the operation for the emergency operation of the existing outlet channel. There was, again, no community consultation funded due to time constraints, they said at this time. So when President Chartrand criticized the province for those delays in the consultation process, they held up the technical review and said the technical review was a consultation. As we know, that is absolutely not the case. Uh, the minister um, tried to uh, explain it in that way, um, but you can't, um, you can't confuse apples and oranges, and, and that's uh, uh, fairly basic. Uh, one of the other things that has happened is that the province has tried to split the project into four little pieces of pie, and, and they uh, are trying to say that, that one has nothing to do with the other, when in fact we know that they are all related and that they are all um, a part of the main project. But in order to limit their exposure, limit their... Uh, their perceived need to consult, they are splitting things up into saying that the road um, has a separate uh, process for consultation. Well, why are you building the road? Why are you building the, um, the uh, 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 power, uh, the hydropower that needs to go in there, if not to build the actual project itself? So those things need to be combined, um, and we can't just uh, allow the province to uh, make up its own rules for consultation, make up its own rules for uh, engagement with, uh, with Indigenous communities. So it has been over six years since the province began studying this province, and it has been four years since the province said that they had a responsibility for a duty to consult. Given the unwillingness to undertake meaningful study of the impact of this project, um, it has been clear that the concerns of our community, the Métis community, has, uh, uh, it has been cl uh, that the project would move forward in spite of any concerns that we had. Indigenous consultation is not the same as inviting us to sit in public open houses. So if we're sitting beside um, an RM or a community, that is not uh, consultation. That is not what the Supreme Court said when they um, made clear what consultation has to be uh, for uh, Aboriginal rights holders, for Indigenous nations. The Supreme Court of Canada is very clear that the duty to consult on our Section 35 rights requires a full, proper, and meaningful process of community consultation. This ongoing pattern of delays, lack of understanding around Crown consultation is leading to a lack of meaningful involvement in this project planning. The Premier and a Minister like to characterize um, the Indigenous uh, communities and nations who have concerns as being um, obstinate, as being in the way of something that needs to happen, when that's absolutely not the case. We are, our, our communities, our families are just as concerned as every other Manitoban that there needs to be uh, a safe, reliable way to uh, divert water in an emergency. But we also have concerns about the environment. We also have concerns about how uh, the fish, uh, the wildlife, um, how uh, the, the drinking water that many of our communities have um, uh, are going to have issues with. Those things have not been addressed. And we need to be a part of it if they are going to be addressed. We need to be a part of the, the engagement process. We need to have, consultation has to be meaningful. Um, the honour of the Crown is more than just a phrase. It needs to be real. It needs to mean something. It actually has legal implications. But this government has done the opposite of the honour of the Crown. 
And I just had a brief conversation before I came in the room here with, um, with some of our staff at the MMF who were speaking with President Chartrand, and he does give his regrets. Um, he is uh, he's practicing his uh, Section 35 rights um, uh, up north right now, and I think uh, if I, um, not speaking on a turn, he was eating moose steak the other night, so I think uh, he was feeling pretty good. But he gives his regrets and he sends his best to everyone here um, because this is such an important issue that, that we have to be a part of it. So I wanted to say that if the province of Manitoba refuses to do an adequate review of the impacts, potential impacts of this project, the MMF will do an, uh, an adequate, adequate review. We have just hired an expert and we're moving forward. We want to uh, extend a hand to our partners sitting around the table here today that uh, we find a way to work together to move this forward, but we, uh, we will do that review and we will see uh, what the impacts are. Uh, it is very unfortunate that the province of Manitoba has uh, reneged on its duty to consult uh, refuses to understand what Section 35 rights are, refuses to read what the Supreme Court of Canada has said about all of these things many times over and over. Um, it's, it's um, I guess at this point in time, it's not a surprise to us how this Premier and this Minister have, uh, have uh, reacted. Uh, it would be a, a very welcome um, opportunity, I think, if they were to extend that olive branch and to come forward and work with us, because I know everyone around this table would welcome that. Um, but in that, in uh, from what all uh, indications that we have, that is not going to happen. So we're uh, going to be the ones who do that review. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Will, um, for that overview. Very nice, um, and I think uh, that sets the. Uh, the scene for us today because um, we, um, we want to get those overviews and we want to uh, have a round table discussion here um, as to um, you know what the history of is it uh, history of it is uh, also um, how we feel about it and how we're going to move forward and what are the messages that we want to the government and the the people of Manitoba and across Canada to to learn about this issue and, and how we are being dealt with. We wanted to um, have a round table and I'm going to turn this over to Carl and he's going to um, um, give us a, an idea of how we want to move forward. I mean basically we want to tell the story that uh, this is how we're being dealt with and um, what, how we feel about it and what are the actions that we need to take to get this government to the table. So Carl. I want to thank everyone uh, online virtually attending this uh, this press conference. I want to thank the chiefs, Chiefs, Chief McLean, uh, Chief Stagg, and, uh, and also Minister Will Goodham and, and Regional Chief Hart in supporting us. Uh, we're very thankful for that. Um, we remain committed to working with the province um, as a, an Indigenous um, stakeholder that will be affected by this project. Uh, the communities have continued to show good faith um, since the concept was first shared with us on Lake St. Martin Channel. Um, we believe it's a province that doesn't want to work with us. Um, you know, systemic racism possible. Um, you know, I'm not afraid to share that. Uh, given the past uh, behaviors uh, of, of this government, it, it shows you that they feel uncomfortable working with us. Um, it's evident given, you know, the court's decision um, and then also the, uh, the injunction that was decided by the Court of Queen's Bench that we filed um, over two, like over a year ago. And, and, and it was decided recently a month ago. It shows you the province's uh, stubbornness and refusal to accept the judge's decision. Uh, we're thankful for our allies and MMF and AFN helping uh, these communities that, that are gonna be affected by this project. Um, and then also using further public tax dollars in court against this decision that was already awarded. That just doesn't make sense to me. I'm a businessman myself, um, I get it. We have small businesses suffering right now. They're gonna further suffer. Um, the government's not doing anything about it. Also, they're not doing anything about this project. Um, they're just hoping that uh, it'll just go through. <laughs> so I, I find that quite uh, concerning uh, as a taxpayer, as well as a citizen of, of, of uh, Manitoba and also a First Nation citizen that has rights protected by Section 35. 
The, province, the provincial government's thinking behind flood management and the outlet channel is firmly based in the past. 2011, 2014, the floods affected Métis and First Nation communities. Those still have not been addressed. So the same approach is being applied here. Uh, we're, we're in the past. Let's continue to operate like we're in the past. Let's just build this thing. Um, those are some of the, 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 the undertones that we, we, we understand that the province is navigating with. And so First, Peace, First Nations people, as stewards of this pristine land and water resources, as well as our, our brothers and sisters with the, uh, the Métis Nation for hundreds of years, um, you know, it's Manitoba's misguided policies and activities uh, that continue to put a drain on the natural resources, you know, while, while polluting the water, draining the wetlands that, that have sheltered our birds, our animals, our fish, and then creating these new conditions that threaten our livelihoods throughout Manitoba. So with that being said, like I shared, we've always been committed to working with them. It's the other side that's not committed to working with us. So we'll open up the... Uh the uh, the floor to uh, are the chiefs, uh, the MMF, and also uh, our uh, regional ch regional chief um, Kevin Hart on um, their response to what the government is uh, is doing right now. I know we did hear a, a good overview from uh, Will, uh, but uh, maybe more s specifics um, as to um, uh, what we're going to do moving forward. I guess uh, you know it, it started in in 2011, 2014, when. Uh, you know, there was no notification to the interlake communities that this water was coming. You know, Lake Manitoba First Nation had one week to uh, prepare for uh, the flood of the century. Uh, we were the first ones hit. Um, we had a dike, um, a dike road built by the provincial government of the day, which was the NDP government. Um, I ran into uh, the former premier. He said, oh, how do you like the road? Well, you know what, I'd rather have my land back. Um, you know, our traditional lands, everything. I'd rather have all that back than have this, uh, this road that's uh, built uh, what they call to lake level 814, so which is higher than the lake. The lake is 811. So, you know, uh, <clears throat> just going forward with that, uh, there's been uh, several impacts to each First Nation. You know, uh, we, can't, we can't never turn the clock back and say, well, we're going to get all of these things back. It, it just doesn't work that way. You know, uh, our industries has been... Um, the fishing industries for other First Nations have been severely impacted where the government has bought up all the quotas to, from the vulnerable people. I've said it in the past, I'll say it again. Uh, uh, they should have put them back into uh, with the people to give them a chance, give other people a chance to have those quotas and, and keep that fishing industry going where, you know, uh, it, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't fair. You know, uh, people might think it's fair, but these, these fishermen are taxpayers as well. You know, every time we step off the First Nation, we pay tax. Um, we're not asking for a handout by any means from any government. Uh, you know, we, we wanted to work with the government of the day. We've always said that our rights are being infringed on, especially the Section 35 rights, you know, the things that were, were, uh, were put to us by the Crown, you know, the Queen, the Queen of the day. Um, there has been no consultation for Lake Manitoba First Nation. They, they've sent a, a letter with all the dates, phone calls, and various things like that. And I'd like to, to thank the, the minister from the MMF to, who made that point clearly that, uh, you know, it needs to be meaningful. It needs to be face-to-face. -face. Um, you know, sure, I'm the, I'm the leader of the day in Lake Manitoba First Nation. We had people from the province attend our community on a consultation. There was only three of us, me and my two councillors there. And we're not having this meeting, I said, because my community members will make the decision on how we move forward with this, uh, with the channel on, on my side. You know, I've always said that in the past. I'll say today again that, you know, uh, because I'm the leader, I have to respect the decision of my people and how Lake Manitoba moves forward, how I move forward with uh, my colleagues from the Interlake Tribal Council because we've been severely impacted right from A to Z. Um, you know, I want to say uh, first and foremost that nobody speaks for us, for the Interlake Tribal Council. Um, we speak for ourselves, and we're a very united group here, and we know what uh, needs to be done, you know, right from, from Chief Glenn Hudson all the way down to, you know, one end to the other to Chief John Stagg. We know the impacts uh, that are going to be put upon us, you know, the fishing industry, the control structures that are going into place. Uh, those things haven't been uh, communicated to us. We're finding things out on our own, like the MMF uh, minister said, you know, uh, 
there's a lot of underlining things here that we don't uh, we don't see. You know, the the food the feedlot uh, in Moosehorn that's going to contaminate the water is all the way down to the Lake Saint Martin, right? You know, so uh, all we want is meaningful consultation. We want to be a part of the process, um, work with the, the province in any way, shape, or form. Uh, you know, um, some say that uh, you know. Uh, uh, the government has a love-hate relationship with First Nations and uh, MMF, but at the end of the day, hey, we're all provincial people here. We're all uh, Manitobans. So all we're asking is, uh, Premier Pallister, your ministers, work with us. Let's uh, let's get this thing uh, going, but let's do it meaningfully. Sit down with us. Come to the table. Um, I'm sure that we can come up with uh, a strategy to to move. Uh, the channels forward. We're not interested in flooding anybody. We're not interested in um, holding anything back. All we are is interested in is trying to get this thing done and and um, have the consultation process, uh, you know, used. Um, we're not saying use it to our benefit, but just let our people know what's happening down the line. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Will. He wants to say a few words. Thanks again, Jim, and uh, thank you very much, Chief McLean, for those words. I think uh, I think it's very clear that we're uh, standing together here today. That uh, um, you know, there's um, there's got to be a recognition from this province that uh, these concerns are not going away. That um, you know, I, I appreciate what Carl had said earlier too. Is that there seems to be a sense that if they just stall, 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 and then push it through, push it through, push it through. Um, that uh, eventually they'll just um, pass it off to a next government and worry about it, who has to worry about it then, the impacts. Um, but we also know that Canada has told Manitoba that they need to talk to us, um, that they need to engage us, that they need to consult with us. And, and you, you know, that was part of the uh, uh, approvals that went through in the first place. And, and if they didn't, uh, fulfill their obligations that Canada has set out and perhaps Canada needs to step in here as well and say Manitoba you haven't said what you were going to do you said you were going to do this and you didn't do it but I wanted to just uh, underline a couple of quick things here um, the MMF definitely I want to be clear the MMF understands that the project needs to be built there is a uh, potential for flooding and the impacts of flooding are going to impact us as much as any other Manitoban so we, we understand that but at the same time, you can't build a permanent set of outlet channels the same way that you build an emergency uh, channel. You have to have that consultation. That It can't be pushed through the same way you did it before. We need to have that full understanding of the environmental impacts. Um, Chief McLean also talked about the traditional economies. There's our, our commercial fishers. There's uh, our, our trappers who are out there who are gonna be affected. There's the our, our hunters who are hunting for sustenance. They're, all those things are gonna be affected. Consultation absolutely needs to mean something. One of the other things that's kind of a little strange is how that Manitoba infrastructure is the proponent and Manitoba conservation and climate is the crown for the consultation purposes. How can, for all, the crown be both the proponent and the crown and try to um, try to consult with us. Um, it's it's a very strange um, way that they're moving forward on this. Um, so there's more than just the minister of infrastructure that needs to be uh, brought to bear here. The minister who's responsible uh, for uh, indigenous issues needs to be brought to bear. The minister for conservation and climate needs to be brought to bear. Those people all need to be at the table. They need to be talking to their uh, cabinet colleagues and saying, uh, look, indigenous leaders are telling you, you haven't done it done done it right. So do it right and let's get this over with. Let's get the project uh, uh, on its way. But we need to be a part of the process because that's who's that's who's going to get the immediate effects is, is uh, First Nations and Métis communities. So uh, thanks very much, Jim, for uh, letting me uh, talk for a couple more minutes. You know, I've been around for a while. I, um, I did a, a six-part uh, uh, series with CBC uh, called The Price of Power, and it, it was about the, the flooding with the, the Northern Reserves. It was called the Northern Flood Agreement at the time. And uh, so we, we looked at that from top to bottom and uh, all the issues surrounding it. Um, and the biggest thing was that the government at, of, of the day did not consult with the First Nations. Um, and first of all, what they did is they came in, they flooded them, 
uh, and then try to um, work out some co uh, compensation. Well, here we have an opportunity to um, circumvent that, to uh, do it right, to consult, uh, and, it, and as Will had said and everybody else has said, the Chiefs have said that um, uh, they have to have a duty to consult with us before they move forward. And um, what I'm getting at is that um, um, recently the government has threatened to um, um, curb or, or shut down the right to protest. And um, um, so, you know, I mean, if, if we try to protest, then uh, what, they're going to send us to jail? Um, so that's one of the issues is, is so uh, what are the next steps? How are we going to deal with this? Um, and um, um, maybe I'll, I'm going to ask um, uh, Regional Chief uh, Kevin Hart to speak to uh, what we can do from a federal um, perspective. Kevin? Thank you, Jim. Yes, uh, you know, obviously it's uh, very concerning what we're seeing and transpiring here in uh, the province of Manitoba. For myself, I'll be working with uh, our national chief to reach out to the various ministers as well as the prime minister to talk about the issue at hand that's happening here in Manitoba without uh, adequate consultation by the province of Manitoba, to talk about those violations, including the violation of treaty, uh, as well as Section 35. We have to remind the province of Manitoba that there are indeed Supreme Court decisions that yet that we're talking about in today day and age, you know, Treaty inherent rights, including uh, Section 30, 35 rights, have not been clearly defined by Canada. So for the province of Manitoba to come forward and define what proper consultation is for First Nations uh, is a gross miscarriage of justice for the interpretation of our treaties by the province of Manitoba and especially in this day and age when you have an attorney general in Manitoba that knows the law as well as the constitutionally protected rights of Aboriginal and First Nation people who have treaty and inherent rights. These are clearly protected under Section 35 of the Canadian Constitution. And it's troubling that after 150 years of confederation, that First Nations people are still looking for equality in 2020 from not only the Canadian government, but looking for respect because First Nations people have fought for this country, to defend this country, to defend the land, to defend the very treaties that had laid the foundation for what we now know as Common Day Canada. Let's not forget that. And that some of those treaties, especially the ones from 70, 1752 onward from our Mi'kmaq uh, relatives, pre-Confederation treaties, those are the very foundation and groundwork of what we see uh, here in uh, present-day Canada. And that the number of treaties that were signed here in Manitoba, you know, have clear definition and con constitutionally protected uh, rights that have clearly not been defined. So for the province of Manitoba to come forward in a definition that they've done meaningful consultation is a gross miscarriage of justice. When we intervene, and for example, a First Nation asking for a stop order of work, it is very uh, underhanded for the province of Manitoba to continue work behind the scenes uh, secretly while a judge's order is in effect, and then later on, uh, as we come right now to present day uh, intervening in this matter, you know, pretty much all that construction was done when First Nations uh, clearly over a year ago have asked for a stop order and a stop work order on the project itself. So, you know, damages need to be uh, incurred by the province of Manitoba to the First Nations. And if you look at the history, uh, I'm no uh, hydrologist or hydro expert, but where is the pro uh, Manitoba Hydro in all of this? Because it's clear that if this channel exists, that it benefits Manitoba Hydro as a crown corporation as a whole, 
because the impacts, if you look at, go all the way up to Cedar Lake and the reservoir that's up there. So to see this without Manitoba Hydro being at the table is, is a clear violation and a gross miscarriage of justice. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, a couple of chiefs lined up now. With, this is our technology, folks. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to uh, Chief Hector Shorting from Little Saskatchewan. He's going to say a few words. Go ahead, Hector. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, chiefs. Uh, the South Outlet Channel that's uh, been proposed to Lake St. Martin, you know, we have concerns uh, because Little Saskatchewan will be the most affected uh, community. You know, there hasn't been any consultation for our community members, and we still have outstanding issues from 2011 flood. You know, there's been an easement that's been proposed to Little Saskatchewan, that uh, the 806 easement, and that's going to uh, flood our community 80%. So uh, we need to be consulted. I know they had some town hall meetings in Moose Horn, but that was for mostly uh, municipalities. So we live in little saskatchewan so we want consultations to be done in our community so our member members could be aware of what's going to happen thank you okay thank you chief um now i do believe we have chief glenn hudson glenn are you there good afternoon and okay, good morning i just first of all want to uh, begin by giving thanks for being here and uh, being able to connect. I know we had uh, technical difficulties earlier. <clears throat> um, I'm not sure who's on the other end uh, that I'm speaking to. Yeah, Glenn, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, Chief Garnet Woodhouse, uh, Chief John Stegg, Chief uh, David Travers, uh, Cornell McLean, Chief Cornell McLean, sorry. Uh, Chief Hector Shorting, Regional Chief Kevin Hart, and also Minister Will Gooden from the Manitoba Media Federation. Okay. Just want to uh, give thanks for being here, Chiefs and uh, Minister. I guess in terms of this project as a whole, you know, it uh, uh, certainly has a, a very much a negative impact on the environment. And uh, you could see how the environment is tied to our ways of our people, that being the culture aspect, that being the hunting, that being the fishing, and obviously the trapping of, uh, in the history of our, of our people. We've always done that uh, time immemorial, and that's our way of life. That's the impacts you know, that are gonna be felt. Those rights are uh, protected by our, our Canadian Constitution. And uh, this is something that uh, no province can uh, override. Uh, no project should be able to override that. And certainly, um, you know, having that enshrined in, in the Constitution is uh, uh, something that uh, uh, we will always have going forward. Um, this, this project uh, certainly will have its negative impact on our fisheries. I know when there was further channels that were done earlier previously, um, it had wiped out our sturgeon um, spawning grounds as far as uh, the fishing industry goes. And, and, you know, sturgeon is something that uh, our people uh, look to, they've been, um, around for many, many thousands of years and uh, for the livelihood of our, of our fishers and for the livelihood of our people, um, we, we rely on that. When it comes down to uh, impacts of uh, uh, livelihoods, obviously, you know, I've spoken on how that environment will change and how it impacts our hunting, fishing, and certainly trapping and the way the way of life of our of our people the province you know was asked many times to show our first nation communities a sustainable plan and the province um 
has never shown us anything like that. No plans like that. I know when it comes down to having, I know uh, Chief Shorting mentioned about having town halls in Moosehorn. You know, people may not have the wherewithal, may not have the ability to jump in a car and drive down to Moosehorn to go to this town hall. You know, and I think it needs to be brought back into our communities as far as consultation goes, but also when it comes down to a sustainable plan, you don't just uh, throw equipment out there and hope for the best in terms of uh, the outcomes. You have to have a sustainable plan. And when it comes down to, you know, our, our environment, as far as sustainability, I know in that area where uh, the road is going in down Idlewild Road, um, we used to hunt back in there in terms of uh, uh, moose harvesting. But when you have these kind of developments happening, it, it, it affects that habitat. And today, you know, the, uh, the province is uh, affecting um, uh, habitat in this area, yet they're, they're putting a stop to moose hunting, which a lot of our people rely on uh, in these areas. So on the one hand, they're putting a stop to moose hunting. On the other hand, they're killing the environment that uh, moose rely on in terms of these projects. So, you know, we have to have a sustainable plan and, and practice. And for thousands of years, you know, time immemorial, our people have always worked with the environment, have always worked with the uh, uh, nature, uh, mother nature in terms of preserving it. And uh, there's no way that we are uh, prepared uh, to give up the, that way of life. Our people rely on it, even today, I'll say, you know, given that there's a, a ban on moose hunting, I encourage people to go out and continue to hunt in a sustainable way and, and take, have that take in terms of that moose. Uh, because again, we relied on that for many, many years going back and we still rely on it. And people can hunt and know how to hunt in, in terms of being able to sustain uh, that, that animal. But when it comes down to killing the environment in terms of carrying out a project like this, it, it's very difficult to uh, practice that sustainability. And they should be speaking to us in, in being able to manage, manage those, uh, those areas in terms of um, having a sustainable plan. We should be a part of that. We live off that land. We live off the environment that is created for these animals and the fisheries and obviously the, and the trapping industry. So they need to sit with us. And again, I know when we changed our court system in Peguis, um, where we had to drive to the nearest town south of us, a lot of people were found guilty because they weren't showing up for court. They had no means to go there. But once we changed it to Peguis, people, the uh, guilty, the guilty charges ended up dropping in numbers because people were able to participate. People were able to go to our, our uh, community hall for court. So the same thing when it comes down to uh, these town halls, you cannot have them away from our community. You have to have them within the community, those consultations, and obviously presenting these sustainable plans. When it comes down to Peguis, we have our treaty land entitlement in place and the province has signed on to this treaty land entitlement in terms of lands of interest. And I know this area in question right now that we, we are looking at, it is a priority to us because of, again, the environment and obviously the uh, animals that are in, in that area. And the province has to come to the table to deal with our treaty land entitlement issues uh, when it comes down to, um, um, this area and, and so far the province has not come to our table to acknowledge our tre treaty land entitlement, which they are a signatory to that. We have a tripartite agreement and a negotiated outcome as far as land that is owed to first nations. And then we're talking crown land in this case. And, uh, you know, they haven't come sat with us to consult in terms of uh, whether we want to select that area 
and to keep it as it is or to look at further developments um, in terms of working with them. Uh, but that's something that uh, needs to be addressed in this case because legally they have signed on that agreement, but they just continue to uh, set us aside in terms of uh, not acknowledging uh, that agreement. There are other alternatives that would cost uh, a lot less in terms of uh, supporting other Manitobans. For example, if we have storage of water in southwestern Manitoba where there is a drought for the past 10 years, <clears throat> we can look at um, having retention ponds put in the south. Uh, Saskatchewan and the Dakotas have structures in place that can be requested to control the movement of water in, co in cooperation with Manitoba. So, you know, there are alternatives to this. This isn't the only solution in terms of building this uh, channel and, and uh, building these roads that go in there. So I, I just wanted to, to share that. When it comes down to the Impact Assessment Agency of Canada, they have to play a more critical role in ensuring they do not approve this project until meaningful Section 35 consultation is taken place and is complete. There's also the Impact Assessment Agency of Canada has to ensure that First Nation communities affected have adequate resources to review the environmental assessments and provide adequate resources to provide advice on the environment in terms of the impact statement required uh, to the province. And uh, I know when we had in our past, when we had negotiated our treaty land entitlement and when we negotiated the um, our uh, illegal taking of our reserve, we had assessments done in the various industries as far as how that impacted and affected uh, negatively our community in terms of lost opportunity and, and and lost uh, revenues as far as various industries are concerned. And this also must be done in terms of uh, the environmental impact uh, statements required um, to the province. We must have these assessments done. How does it affect the moose population? How does it affect the, the fishing, the spawning grounds? How does it affect you know, uh, the beaver? Uh, muskrat, etc. What a lot of people rely on for their sustenance today. We have to understand that. The federal ministers must also get involved with any of the depths that are also affected by this project. Example, Indigenous Services Canada, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, Transport Canada, etc. The various departments. Obviously, you know, by seeing in the news today what's happening to the Mi'kmaq down in Nova Scotia there. Uh, their Section 35 rights um, have been, uh, in terms of the practices um, in, in sustaining themselves and being able to harvest, I guess in this case, the lobster, it has gone to court twice and it has been decisions at the Supreme Court level uh, that they have to deal with these th these issues. But yet governments of Nova Scotia, various departments that are involved like ISC, DFO, um, et cetera, they, they pass the buck. Even the protection of the RCMP that's happening over there, that's lacking because of us being First Nations. There's, I know it was mentioned about systemic racism. There's systemic racism entrenched in these processes that just bypass us because of who we are as First Nations. So we need to address these things before um, this type of development proceeds. You know, so I just wanted to, to speak on, on these topics. And uh, I think there's, uh, you know, many, many impacts, negative impacts to our people. And today with this pandemic, you know, people are relying in terms of on the environment, in terms of our lands and our waters to be able to sustain ourselves right now. You know, and, and uh, when it comes down to, um, I guess, just an example to provide, um, 
you know, in terms of the economy and what Manitoba Hydro, I know it was mentioned about uh, them uh, should be taking part. This is all about building an industry in terms of uh, having um, hydroelectricity and, and increasing that capacity. Sure, that helps uh, many people, but on, on the flip side, when things break down, when uh, we cannot sustain ourselves in terms of uh, relying on hydro, we had a power outage last year that where power was down for 10 days to 24 days in some of our communities. Our people, um, some of the people couldn't sustain themselves, but the people that lived off the land, they, they were able to stay in our communities, uh, even elders, you know, not just the young people, but even elders, they built fires outside. They were able to uh, take the, the meat that they have in their freezers, moose meat in this case, or deer meat or elk meat and cook it out on that open fire. And we were sustaining ourselves during that period where we had that power outage. But at the same time, um, I know it, it was very, very difficult time for a lot of people in this province, but our people turned to the land, turned to those resources um, in terms of that sustenance to be able to, to, be able to look after themselves. And so when it comes down to, you know, examples like that, uh, we need to have that environment protected and make sure there's proper processes in place in terms of consulting with us to ensure our livelihood continues, our, our well-being of our communities continue, and the well-being of our people. We cannot just be set aside. We have to be uh, a part of this process, and, and we do have solutions. You know, we do come to the table with solutions. I shared a, a few of them with you just, just previously. So we're all about working together. That's what our treaties were about, working together in peace and harmony, not, one, not a government bringing a, a bulldozer in or an excavator and just barging their way through with, with no regard to us as Indigenous people. They have to sit down and consult and deal with us. So I just wanted to uh, say these few words today, and I give thanks for being able to express that. And, uh, you know, we, we were here for thousands of years in the past, and we're going to be here for thousands of years going forward. And I know this government today, their, their mandate only lasts five years. After five years, they'll be gone, but we'll still be here. And those impacts will be felt negatively if we're not dealt with in a proper and sustainable way. And we have to be a part of that solution. So I just want to give thanks today. Miigwech. Okay, miigwech, uh, Chief Hudson. Um, I'm your MC, but I'm, I'm also uh, kind of like uh, in this virtual age, I'm um, uh, directing traffic, uh, uh, <laughs> you know. So uh, I know there's uh, about 20 other people on online, and uh, we want to have an opportunity for you guys to participate, ask some questions. But uh, uh, before we do that, uh, uh, we have uh, Grand Chief um, Jerry Daniels from the Southern Chiefs Organization, and he, he's going to say a few words. Uh, Jerry? Uh, good morning. I uh, just want to uh, thank uh, the Interlake uh, Reserve Tribal Council for hosting uh, this very important uh, conversation and discussion about uh, all of the different uh, uh, problems that we're seeing with uh, the province of Manitoba as it relates to uh, the Lake Manitoba, Lake St. Martin Channels Outlet project. It's an ongoing, um, an ongoing uh, issue of contention and uh, I think it's important uh, that people know and understand what's happening here. Uh, the leadership for a long time, uh, going back right to treaty and even before, uh, you can go right back to the Treaty of Selkirk where uh, we've always been uh, good partners, you know, uh, and, and I would say we've saved the lives of many descendants you know, when uh, Chief Pegwis uh, stood up and, and, and fed and, and sheltered, you know, many of the people who were, who were, uh, who were within his area, you know, and that, that is an example of uh, the kind of people we are. You know, we're very honorable and we always hold our, our uh, side of the bargain. 
So we agreed to share the land uh, with many of the people who came here actually uh, in, you know, during the uh, First and Second World War around that time. We had an influx of about 300,000 people into the Manitoba region. And that's the history. You know? And from that time uh, we developed uh, different institutions uh, throughout Winnipeg and Manitoba. And uh, a culture developed, a culture of, of, uh, of racism, uh, of bigotry. And, uh, and that culture uh, creeped in as, as, as those who had no care about uh, their responsibility to the original keepers of this land. And that culture uh, has uh, shaped uh, the conflict that we see today. It has shaped uh, the uh, uh, quality of life of Indigenous people because we have been subjugated and our economies eroded and our partnership uh, has been shelved in many ways. You know, decades and decades of uh, being isolated on our First Nations communities, being uh, blocked from participating in the economy, uh, very similar to what you're seeing on the East Coast uh, with the Mi'kmaq. You know, policy uh, that is uh, restricting First Nations development and restricting uh, First Nations ability to create opportunity. And that's what we're talking about. And this, this channel uh, that we're seeing is going to have a great impact, you know, on our, on our, on our relatives, uh, you know, the four-legged ones and all the, all, all the flying uh, uh, relatives that we have in that area, the fish, you know, and uh, I don't think they've been very good at communicating the impact of this project uh, to us and to the greater public. I think it gets caught up in uh, technical uh, wording and positioning and political grandstanding by the, by the Premier and his cabinet. And that's what we're faced with, you know. And uh, the, the federal government, uh, with their, uh, uh, you know, their own uh, uh, mechanisms, the environmental assessments uh, uh, that they develop, uh, has a great responsibility because they created the province. They recognized them, they financed them. They created investment entities that would uh, uh, streamline investment here and development and support economic uh, expansion in Manitoba. That's how Manitoba was created, through foreign investment. And even today, uh, much of the investment is, is done from outside, much of the, the money that's invested here to, to help with the development, not necessarily owned by Manitobans or even Canadians. And so I think that's important for people to understand because we're working very hard for our communities. The people in our communities are our family. They're our children. And uh, we're, we're very concerned about the impacts that this kind of type of arrangement is going to have. And uh, I think that the federal government needs to be very proactive in developing a fair uh, process. You know, consultation is something that we spoke about 10, 20 years ago. We have to move to accommodation. We have to move to First Nations control of infrastructure spending and strategizing. And we have to be equal partners at the table. And until the province and, and until the federal government uh, is able to create that sort of environment, you're going to continue to see conflict. And you're going to continue to see the courts and the lawyers benefit a great deal uh, because we have to always go to them and you see now, even with the province restricting, uh, attempting to restrict uh, our ability to stand in the way of these kinds of policies. And I tell you, when people have no choice, when people are, are put against the wall, uh, they have to stand up. And sometimes it's going to be an inconvenience regardless of the laws. If people didn't challenge the laws in this, in this world, we would see nothing but an unjust society persecution of people and, 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 and mass depression because only a few people would, would be in charge. And that's not the kind of society that I think Canadians believe in. I think we believe in a democratic, fair society built on equity and values that we can all share. So that's why uh, I'm here with our chiefs. That's what we stand for. And we call on the federal government to create that kind of arrangement to ensure 
that we're not just people to be consulted with. We are the rightful owners of these lands. And when you talk nation to nation, you're talking about a fair process, a, a collaborative strategy, not one where we're positioned as advisors or people who are simply in the way of development. That is not who we are. We want to be active partners and we want to create a prosperous society. That's who we are. And I hope those who are listening understand that. And I want to uh, continue uh, to, to tell everyone who's listening that we're working very hard and we're collaborating with all of our partners and all of our allies in the pursuit of a just society. And this, this channel, this project, uh, Pallister really needs to come to the table with, with a true uh, plan for partnership. And I, I don't have a lot of um, confidence in that happening. You know, I, I think he's a racist at, at, at the core of him. And uh, it's really too bad for those of us who really care about wanting to see a fair and just society. And uh, with that, I want to thank you uh, for giving me a few moments to share my thoughts on how we need to move forward and, and the issues that are, are in the way of, of creating a resolution uh, to this project. Miigwech. Miigwech, uh, Grand Chief. Um, so as I said, uh, I'm um, going to get into my role as the uh, air traffic controller here and uh, get some other planes to land. Um, I know we have people online, and uh, Jesse has just told me that if you have anything that you wanted to add, questions, there's reporters there as well, uh, we'll open the floor to that at this point. Go ahead, Will. Thanks, Jim, and I, I apologize. I know I no, no. already spoke a couple times, but I had a, a thought while we're uh, listening here. I want to say thank you to all the uh, chiefs, the grand chief, for uh, um, all your good words, excellent message. I think that uh, sense, I think if anything, that's about as clear a message as you, as you can send to uh, Broadway. But I, I just wanted, I was uh, reflecting on something because today is Louis Riel's birthday, uh, 176 years ago. And Louis Riel, when, when the Crown, when the government um, tried to move into Manitoba here, he, w he went and stepped on the surveyor's chain. And he said, no, not until you talk to us. And I have no doubt in my mind that Louis Rail would be with us here today and he would say, no, I'm stepping on the chain until you talk to us. So I think, I think that there's some uh, parallels that have happened in the past that we need to look at here, but I think it's also true that we need to do what we're doing here today, standing together, saying, no, you have to talk to us. So I just wanted to uh, throw that in there. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Will. Um... Hi, good morning, Tansay. My name's Amanda Laughlin, and I'm the MLA for the Paw Kamisa constituency, which consists of many of our First Nations that are present here today uh, within my constituency. I had the honor to attend uh, a media panel uh, back earlier this past year, this past winter, this year. And um, again, no minister, no uh, representative from the government is there. I don't know if there's anyone online that's representing the government. But um, I just wanted to share as an MLA and as somebody who's actually sitting there within the chamber with my colleague, Ian Bushy, uh, the MLA for Kiwitanuk, um, it is quite apparent that this government that we're dealing with are severely failing their indigenous uh, studies, if you will. Uh, like I shared at the last media panel, um, there's a great concern, there's a great uh, huge gap in between um, Indigenous issues and this government and the ability to uh, connect. Um, when I was elected in 2015, uh, we went into an election in 2016, but during that one year I was in government, when the NDP was in government that last year, and I was able to sit in a beautiful committee room within the legislative building with the Minister of Aboriginal and Northern Affairs, along with other ministers, justice, education, uh, families, uh, infrastructure, uh, environment. Uh, everyone was there to talk about, uh, to gather for the Indigenous Issues Committee, right? So the minister was being informed about any issue affecting Indigenous people here in Manitoba. Now, when the new government took over, um, 
I have to emphasize that they, they got rid of that Indigenous Issues Committee. It was like they treated that topic, you know, we got this, you know, we, we don't need to have our minister to be informed or to discuss this as a collective. And with that, when I was the critic for, they changed the name, when I was the critic for Indigenous and Municipal Relations at the time, um, not it was very rare that the critic and the minister and I spoke to each other during question period. Even though I, I asked a lot of questions about Indigenous issues, the other ministers got up. And it, it bothers me how the minister, who is now called the Minister for Indigenous and Northern Relations, is still not able to get up. And now Ian Bushy is now the critic. So that's a, that's a really good, um, that's really good evidence that there is no connection with our Indigenous issues and the current Minister for Indigenous and Northern Relations. Uh, we don't speak to each other as critics and that needs to change. And that's why they are failing at understanding what this consultation process is all about. Um, like I said, this current government is failing their Indigenous studies and we need to use your MLAs, myself, Ian Bushy, to help as advocates, to help push for this meeting to happen with Ron Schuler, the current minister. We sit across from him in question period. I'll be in town next week for a session. And there's, there's, there's an opportunity for us to go to him personally and request this meeting and advocate on, on your behalf. So the purpose of this meeting was to look at other options to bring the province to the table. Well, utilize your MLA, utilize your critic, uh, that's what our job is here as um, the opposition party. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, I believe uh, Ian Bushy um, wants. Uh, we'll, we'll say a few words. Uh, Ian, uh, thanks for the uh, for the, for the chance to speak here today. I also want to uh, acknowledge the Treaty One Territory. On thank uh, Island Lake Tribal Interlake Tribal Council for um, for the invite as well as the MMF. Um, as it was mentioned earlier, I am uh, Ian Bushy. I'm the uh, MLA for Kiwatanuk, which covers basically a large part of the northeast section of the province, um, southeast communities, uh, island lake communities, among others. Um, and I'm also a former chief, a former chief of Hollow Water First Nation. So when, when issues of Section 35 come about, it, it's something that I that I really take to heart because it's something that I that I went through and uh, had the opportunity to experience in my time as chief. And my time at the time, it was the government of the day, which was an NDP. And we had some issues with our Section 35 consulting with some cottage developments. So I really took that to uh, to task and held the government to task at the time. And it, nothing has changed. The government of, of today is still not um, consulting um, with Indigenous communities. Uh, they're not seeing Indigenous communities as stakeholders. They're not seeing Indigenous communities as equals at the table. They're not seeing them as a government to government relationship, which is very unfortunate. Um, in regards to the channel project itself, um, one of the things that, I, that I've noticed and now having the opportunity now being about a year or so into the into the Manitoba legislature is that how little things have actually changed. And what I mean by that is the consultation process and how um, First Nation communities and Indigenous communities, MMF, are, are not fair um, players at, at the table. And in this government in particular, in particular, the premier um, has, has a real strong tendency to blame, blame others for the shortcomings of himself, his government and his ministers. Um, he's gotten up there and he's spoken time and time again about how the federal government is changing things, how indigenous communities are changing things. Uh, I think the term he used at one time was moving the yardsticks uh, in regards to the environmental process with the channel project, which is just unsatisfactory. Um, they sit in the house in the chamber and they tout about how the consultation process that this government in particular and they and they pat themselves on the back that this government in particular is having great uh, consultations uh, and I've called for that well where's that list uh, exactly what is that consultation process what does it entail uh, how many meetings who's attended the meetings um, is a consultation in their mind just a simple phone call to a voicemail? Is it a participation list at a, at a meeting that they've held in a non-Indigenous community? And that's just unacceptable. So the other thing that Palliser tends to do when I talked about him, his shortcomings, is he likes to blame. So he likes to blame, and in this case, he's trying to blame 
and criminalize First Nation communities for holding up this process when we're doing no such thing. And when I say we, I'm also first and foremost, as I am a sitting MLA here in, in Manitoba, but I'm an Indigenous person first and foremost. Um, so we've made attempts to, to do things properly, uh, to come to the table, and in, especially what uh, IRTC is doing here today. We're sitting here at the table trying to uh, ask, request the government to come to the table, nation to nation, government to government, and have a, an honest and open discussion about the process of consultation. But that's not happening. In fact, the, the opposite is happening. The government is not, not wanting to have those discussions. But at the same time, we're trying to sit here and have an open dialogue across the table, calmly, and in every aspect of fairness that we want to do. But then on the, on the flip side of that, Pallister is, always look, is also looking to his future, and he's looking to criminalize and shut down the right of anybody to demonstrate a protest and calling it illegal blockades every time a First Nation community wants to get up and speak. So he's trying to criminalize your right to be able to speak in a fair manner. And what are we trying to do here? The simple thing in a matter of, and it was it was interesting that Jim had mentioned the Northern Flood Agreement. So what was that? That, that was a compensation after the fact. So IRTC is sitting here today and the Interlake Reserve Tribal Council communities are sitting here today trying to make things right before it becomes wrong. And I applaud you for that. And as, as, the, as the MLA for Kiwatanuk and the uh, critic for Indigenous relations, uh, I can tell you first and foremost that I will do everything I can to be able to advocate on your behalf, to push the issues, to give us an equal footing at the table and an equal seat at the table with this provincial government. So we wish for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Ian. Um, so, um, we have a list now, uh, we're developing a list. So uh, Liberal Leader uh, Dougal Lamont, uh, you have the floor. Thank you so much for inviting me uh, here today. Uh, I just wanna say, you know, you know, Manitoba Liberals stand in solidarity with the MMF and First Nations and all the communities in the Interlake whose lives have been disrupted for so long by flooding and whose concerns are being ignored uh, by the Pallister government. And, and, and part of what I wanna do is send a message uh, to all Manitobans to understand this, because it is incredibly important that all, under, all Manitobans understand the truth of what is happening here. Because the MMF and First Nations and the federal government are simply asking that a massive $500 million project be done by the book. And that, that the provincial government, that the Pallister government follow the law. And I think there are absolutely comparisons with what's happening in Nova Scotia with the Mi'kmaq, where you have Indigenous people following the law, uh, operating according to their rights, and then you have other people, uh, white people and settlers ignoring the law. So what is happening today? All that is happening today is that First Nations and Métis are asking for this to be done properly. It is a huge project with huge impacts on communities who've already suffered terrible harm because the Manitoba government chose to flood them in the past. And in the last year alone, I've met dozens of people who are still homeless because they were flooded out in 2011. I've met ranchers, some were Métis, some were non-Indigenous whose land was spoiled by the Manitoba government's decision to deliberately flood communities in 2011 and provide no compensation. So this project will have a massive impact on communities. It'll have a massive impact on the environment, on, on wilderness, on wildlife, on fishing. It has to be done right. But the PCs have chosen to cut corners on this project and just and to blame everybody else for their own incompetence. To give an indication of how bad the province's application for the Lake St. Martin outlet was, it did not include a map of Lake St. Martin. The federal government had to ask for 27 pages of corrections, additions, and changes because the Pallister government was so sloppy in the way that they approach this massive project. And I was at, uh, I, I was privileged to be a, a guest of yours. I had the honor of being your guest. Uh, I believe it was in February when we talked about the complete lack of consultation. And as Grand Chief Daniel said, we need to move beyond consultation. This is not just about lip service. We have to start working in partnership. Is we are all, we are all in this together. We all are gonna have to live together with this. 
and that no Manitoban should ever be treated this way because we are all ultimately Manitobans. And we have to break the terrible bad habits of the past where we, where First Nations and Indigenous people and Métis are treated as second-class citizens or people who can just be steamrolled. This is, and, and, and to, to Minister Gooden's comment, this is Louis Riel's birth, birthday today. And Riel, Riel stood up against these things because it was what Canada was doing at the time was not acceptable and was not appropriate. And we need to find ways to resist this and to stop this from happening and make sure it's done properly. Because ultimately that's what, that's what the Riel rebellion, no, not even a rebellion, that's what the resistance in 1870 was about. It was about standing up and asserting positively that people have rights, that those rights have to be followed and there's a better way of doing things that isn't lawless, that's fair, that includes everybody. So I thank you all very much for the opportunity. We'll be reaching out to our federal counterparts uh, and we're more than happy to work with all parties in the legislature to make this happen. Um, I, I, I cannot say strongly enough how important this is uh, to all of Manitobans because uh, it really is no Manitoban should be treated this way and that every Manitoban should be on board with making sure that First Nations and Indigenous, Indigenous people are treated properly um, and that we work together in partnership. Thank you. Thank you, Dougald. We have, um, we'd like to get some final words from um, IRTC and I'm going to ask Chief Cornell McLean to uh, say some closing remarks. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, I just wanted to mention, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we forgot to mention, we should have but foremost, uh, the grassroots people that were impacted by, um, you know, the flood of 2011-2014. Uh, There's currently some outstanding CSA agreements for two First Nations, um, you know, the province and the federal government should be addressing uh, in order to move forward, um, you know, the power outage of uh, from last year. We're still not fully uh, compensated. Our communities are not compensated, but reimbursed. Uh, um, you know, we had a we had a call with the federal government yesterday on that, and you know, hopefully, we're going to see some uh, some progress moving forward. But I think um, <clears throat> at the end of the day, for the First Nations, for us, for the, the Métis people of Manitoba, uh, the consultation process is was a very strong commitment by this government. Uh, the, gov the federal government uh, uh, recognizes that and that the provincial government should recognize that, that there's processes that need to be followed. Um, you talk about uh, uh, charging us if we try and hold up uh, anything. We've never ever once mentioned we were going to hold anything up, nor will we, unless uh, it, it's, it's absolutely necessary. And I don't think uh, in our territory that any, there's any provincial uh, roads there, you know, uh, not consider, considered anyway. So we wouldn't be doing anything illegally if, if we did hold something up. Um, you know, I, I guess I wanted to speak about one last thing. Um, they talk about being uh, compliant and transparent. Well, we're trying to be compliant with, uh, with the night lighting rules that are set out. The government of Manitoba needs to be compliant and it needs to be transparent and, and follow those rules that they, they've made for us. You know, as First Nations people, the Canadian Constitution, the uh, Supreme Court of Canada, recognize night lighting, and all of a sudden we fall under provincial jurisdiction. I don't think so. But we have applied for a permits. There's been no, no callbacks or nothing from the provincial government. Pick up your phone, give us a call. Um, there's not many of us that, uh, that do that, but... You know, for the ones that do, they, they, they harvest and they, and they feed their food, the, their families. So, you know, I did speak to Eileen Clark, um, and, uh, you know, uh, I'm not going to defend her, but she hurt herself. You know, she, she wasn't able to attend. She, she also said that if she would, she would, but, you know, get well, uh, Minister Clark. Um, thank you for all the MLAs that came, uh, the minister from the MMF, uh, Grand Chief Daniels, Regional Chief Hart, you know, a special thanks to the executive director, uh, Carl Zadnick, for, for, for putting this together and all the IRTC staff. This is for the people uh, of the Interlake area, um, you know, just to, to recognize that we won't be forgotten. You know what, we're going to continue to fight for our rights um, and uh, move things forward. Miigwech. Thank you, Chief. Uh, so I'm going to turn this over to Carl for closing prayer. Thank you, uh, Jim. Thank you as well, uh, Cornell, for the kind comments there. 
Um, I also want to thank MMF and AFN and SEO in solidar um, support for us. Uh, Miigwech to that. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to discuss the issues, collaborate together with our partners and allies. And also, we're just hopeful that uh, the government listens to our voiced concerns, as well as ongoing issues that need to be addressed. Uh, give us wisdom. Help us to always remain peaceful. In Jesus' name, amen.